Hi, I'm Ned, and I make games. Have you ever wondered how lighting and shadows work in Unity? Or do you want to write your own shaders for the Universal Render Pipeline, but without the shader graph? Either because you need some special feature, or just prefer writing code by hand, this tutorial has you covered. In fact, this is the second part in a series about writing HLSL shaders for URP. In this video, I'll show how to add lighting to a shader. This includes a simple explanation of shadow mapping, how objects cast and receive shadows in URP, as well as an introduction to keywords and shader variants, an important concept when writing any type of shader. If you prefer written tutorials, check out the article version of this tutorial in the video description. You'll also find links to the rest of the tutorials in this series. If you're starting here, I would recommend watching the first video in the series where we write a basic unlit shader. This video will continue directly from it. Before I move on, I want to thank all my patrons for helping make this series possible and give a big shout out to my next gen patron, Kruby Dooby Doo. Thank you all so much. And with that, let's get started. So far, we've learned how to write unlit shaders, or shaders not affected by any light. Obviously, lighting is a very important aspect of rendering, and programmers devote a lot of shader code to it. Luckily for us, URP provides a helper function which deals with much of it. In URP's lighting.hlsl file, there is a function called Universal Fragment Blend Fong. It computes a standard lighting algorithm called the Blend Fong Lighting Model. Blend Fong is actually composed of two components. The first calculates diffuse lighting, which eliminates the side of an object facing towards a light. The second computes specular lighting, the shine or highlight that brings a smooth object to life. Open mylit forward lit pass.hlsl and in the fragment function, call universal fragment blend fong. It returns a color, which we can just return as well. Universal fragment blend fong takes many arguments, but to keep things neat, it bundles them up into two structures. The first, called input data, holds information about the position and orientation of the mesh at the current fragment. The second, called surface data, holds information about the surface material's physical properties, like color. Define a variable for both. These structures have nearly a dozen fields each, but we don't need to set them all yet. Unlike C-sharp, structure fields must be manually initialized. To set all fields to zero, cast a zero to the structure type. This looks really strange, but it's an easy way to initialize the structure without having to know all of its fields. Now, pass input data and surface data to Universal Fragment Blend Fong. Back in part one, I mentioned that there are several differences between Unity 2020 and Unity 2021. Well, here's the first that affects our shader. In Unity 2020, URP does not have an overload of Universal Fragment Blend Fong that takes a surface data structure You'll have to pass in the fields individually, like this. For now, don't worry about what each field means, we'll get to all of them soon. Both to keep this tutorial more organized and to help you upgrade projects in the future, I want the same code to run in Unity 2020 and Unity 2021. Thankfully, there's an easy way to run different code depending on the current Unity version. You might have seen a hash if preprocessor command in C Sharp. Usually it omits code that should only run in the editor. Hash if is also available in ShaderLab and HLSL, where it's a common site. If the expression following hash if is true, then the code in between the hash if and the hash end if will compile, otherwise the compiler ignores it. Hash if can only depend on values that are known before compiling code, like constants and number literals. Unity provides a constant called Unity version, which contains the current Unity version as an integer, basically the version number with periods omitted. So, in our fragment function, we want to switch between passing the surface data struct or its individual fields based on the Unity version. If the version is greater than or equal to 202102, we can pass the structure. To define an else block, which works just like you'd expect, use hash else. Inside, call the version with individual arguments. Now our shader code will dynamically change depending on which Unity version we're working with. In Unity 2020, it'll look like this. In 2021, it'll look like this. Pretty cool. For the future, if you need to support another possibility, you can use a hash elif, which is short for else if. Here's an example for a hypothetical Unity 2030.3 version, but let's stick with the present. Check out your shader in the scene editor 
it's now just a black sphere. To get back to where we were before, we need to set some data into the input structs. From the color properties, we can set albedo and alpha, which are fancy names for base color and transparency. But remember that the shader doesn't support transparency just yet, so don't really expect any. Next we need something called a normal vector. You may have heard of normal vectors from math or Unity's physics systems, but they're just vectors that point directly outwards from a surface. Blin Fong uses them to find where the mesh faces a light source. Normal vectors apply to faces on the mesh, but they're organized into a mesh vertex stream, like position or UVs. This can complicate things. There's no problem on a sphere, but on sharp cornered meshes like this cube, it can look like vertices have multiple normal vectors. In reality, Unity duplicates vertices, one for each normal vector. This way, one normal corresponds to exactly one vertex, and the normal always matches the face that's connected to it. Regardless, the input assembler will take care of gathering normal data. Add a new field to the attribute struct tagged with the normal semantic. These normals are also an object space, like position. When adding a new data source to a shader, it's useful to plan out its journey through your code. Blinfong uses normals in the fragment stage, but they're only accessible through the input assembler. We need to pass them through the vertex stage and interpolate them with the rasterizer. In addition, Universal Blinfong expects normals in world space, and it's necessary to transform them at some point. We could do that in the fragment stage, but we don't need object space normals there at all. It's a bit more optimal to calculate world space normals in the vertex function since it runs fewer times than the fragment function. Using this plan, go through the code section by section and modify it as needed. We already added a normal OS field to attributes. Add a normal WS field to the interpolator struct. The rasterizer will interpolate any field tagged with a text chord semantic, so tag normal with text chord 1. Why 1 and not 0? Well, text chord 0 is already taken by UVs, and two fields can't have the same semantic. The rasterizer can handle a bunch of text chord variables, so 2 is no problem. In the vertex function, transform the normal vector from object space to world space. URP provides another function to do this, similar to the one that we use for positions. Call it and set the world space normal in the interpolator struct. In the fragment function, set the normal in the input data struct. Before moving on, let's think a little about what happens to the normal vector when it's interpolated. When the rasterizer interpolates vectors, it interpolates each component individually. This can cause a vector's length to change, like in this example. For lighting to look its best, all normal vectors must have a length of 1. This requirement is common when a vector encodes a direction. We can bring any vector to a length of 1 using the aptly named normalize function. Normalize is kind of slow since it has an expensive square root calculation inside. I think this step is definitely worth it for smoother lighting. It's especially noticeable on specular highlights. But if you're pressed for processing power, you can skip it. Let's not here though. In the scene editor, we finally have lighting, but it looks a little flat with only diffuse lighting. For specular highlights, URP needs a little more data, specifically world space position. Right now, the fragment function does not have access to world space position, only pixel positions. There's not an easy way to transform these back to world space. It's best to pass it as another field in the interpolator struct. Tag it with another free text chord variable. Note that I reorganize them here a little bit, just for personal preference. Set position in the vertex stage using URP's handy transform function. Then in the fragment function, set position WS and input data. No need to normalize here of course since position is not a direction and can have any length. If you move around an object using the default lit shader, you'll notice that highlights also move slightly. This is because specular lighting depends on the view direction or the direction from the fragment to the camera. We can calculate this in the fragment function from the world space position using another URP function. Call it, then set view direction world space in input data. Highlights can sometimes have different colors than albedo and URP allows you to specify this with a specular field in the surface data struct. For now, just set it to white. If you take a peek at the scene, you'll still see no highlights, 
it turns out that Universal Fragment Blin Fong uses a hash shift command internally to toggle highlights on and off. It uses a special type of constant called a keyword to do so. Keywords are sort of like Boolean constants that you can enable using a hash define command. Shaders make extensive use of keywords to turn on and off different features. It's faster to disable specular lighting instead of, for instance, setting specular color to black. Either option has the same visual effect, but not evaluating something is obviously quicker than throwing out the result. However, I do want specular lighting in this shader. For organization, I define keywords in the shader lab file for each pass, making it obvious which keywords are enabled at a glance. Add hash define specular color to your pass block. Finally, highlights. But they're pretty big. Your P provides an easy way to shrink them using a value called smoothness. The higher the smoothness, the smaller the highlight. Visualize a perfectly smooth metal ball. The highlight is pretty focused. For now, let's define smoothness using a material property. Add a property called smoothness of the float type to your shader. In my let forward pass, declare it at the top of the file, and then set it to the surface data structure. Using the material inspector, you can control the size of the highlight using the smoothness property. Note that smoothness works differently depending on the Unity version. 2021's implementation is much more sensitive. This is just a consequence of how URP calculates lighting behind the scenes. One note before we move on, the shader only supports the main light for now. We should get the basics down before complicating things with additional lights, but I will show how to add support for them in part 5 of this series. So far, we've worked with just one object. If you create another, you'll notice that objects with our shader neither cast nor receive shadows. These are two separate concepts in the world of shaders, and we'll need to implement them both. First, let's investigate how URP handles shadows with an algorithm called shadow mapping. The end goal is to find a cheap way to check if a fragment is in shadow with respect to any light source. Again, let's only consider the main light. A naive approach is to check for an object between the fragment and the light. This is very slow since the shader would have to execute a raycast, looping through all objects in the scene. There's got to be a faster way. First, let's restructure our algorithm to orient the ray starting from the light and then shooting out in a straight line, intersecting our fragment and any other surfaces on the same line. Second, notice that only one surface on the ray is lit. For every surface but the one closest to the light, there is an object between it and the light. To determine if a fragment is in shadow, we can simply test if the distance to the light is greater than the minimum distance among all surfaces to the light. This reduces the problem to finding the distance from the light to the closest surface along all light rays. If you think about it, this kind of sounds familiar. When rendering, we draw the color of the closest surface to the camera along all view rays. Switch color with a distance and the camera with a light and we're in business. How can we draw distance? Remember that colors are just numbers, so we can store distance inside the red channel of a color. URP's shadow mapping system does this behind the scenes. Before rendering color, it switches the camera to match the perspective of the main light. Then it utilizes another shader pass, the shadow caster pass, to draw distance for each pixel. We don't want these distances to draw to the screen though. URP hijacks the presentation stage and directs it to draw to a special texture called a render target. This specific render target containing distances from a light is called a shadow map, hence the algorithm name. To calculate if a fragment is in shadow, we need our distance from the light and the distance stored in the shadow map. To sample the shadow map, we need to calculate the shadow map UV, known as a shadow chord, corresponding to the fragment's position. URP again comes through with a function to convert world space position to a shadow chord. URP will deal with comparing distances and sampling the shadow map if we just set the shadow chord in the input data struct. In the fragment function of myletforwardpass.hlsl, go ahead and do that. Similarly to specular lighting, URP toggles shadows on and off with a keyword called main light shadows. However, what if I'm making a dark scene with no main light? In that situation, I'd like to turn off shadows, but I don't want to create a whole new shader with only this keyword undefined. Luckily, Unity has a system of shader variants for exactly this case, 
Using this hash pragma multi-compile command, we can have Unity compile a version of the shader with and without main light shadows enabled. These two versions are called variants of our shader, but more specifically, variants of the forward lit pass. Multi-compile can also take a whole list of keywords, in which case it will create multiple variants, one with each individual keyword enabled. By adding this single underscore, it will also compile a variant with none of the keywords enabled. Conveniently, materials will automatically choose the correct variant for the situation at hand. If you want to use a variant with main light shadows enabled, simply call enable keyword main light shadows on the material in C sharp. Disable keyword will undefine the keyword. Europe does this automatically if it detects a directional light in the scene. Create an object with a default lit material and move it between your my lit object and the light. If you don't see shadows now, turn off cascades and soft shadows on your URP settings asset. Hmm, it would be nice to support both of those options for better quality shadows though. We've been talking like the main light has a position, but since it models the sun, it actually is infinitely far away from everything in the scene. From the shader's perspective, anyway. This makes it difficult to create a shadow map containing the entire scene while keeping enough detail for good quality. Unity tries to balance this with something called Cascades, where it renders multiple shadow maps, each containing a larger slice of the scene. Then it samples the one with the most detail at any position. Since the shadow map has square pixels, you sometimes see their jagged edges manifest on surfaces. Soft shadows help eliminate these artifacts by sampling the shadow map a few different times around the given shadow chord. It will then average the samples, which effectively blurs the shadow map a bit. We don't really need to worry about the details of either system though. We only need to enable two keywords and URP will take care of the rest. Add more multi-compile commands for these new keywords. With multiple multi-compile commands, Unity will permute each and create a variant for every possible combination of keywords. We've barely started, but that's already six variants. Each does take time to compile, so it's worth it to keep this number low. With that in mind, Unity 2021 tweaked the cascade system a little. In 2020, you have to enable keywords for both the main light shadows and cascades. But in 2021, enabling cascades implies that main light shadows are enabled. We can handle both cases using a hash shift block and reduce the variant count in 2021. Also notice the underscore fragment suffix in the soft shadows pragma. We can save a little bit more compile time by signaling that the shadow soft keyword is only used in the fragment stage. Unity will have the variants created by this multi-compile command share a vertex function. Let's test things out. Be sure to adjust shadow cascades and enable soft shadows to see all your shader variants at work. You can see URP dynamically compiling shader variants when your shader momentarily flickers magenta. Now seems like a good time to introduce a powerful debugging tool, the Frame Debugger. Find it in the window dialog under Analysis. Make sure that your game view is visible. Enable it using this button in the top left. It will also automatically pause when in play mode. This useful window tells you all kinds of information about how Unity renders your scene. It renders objects in the order that they appear in the menu. You can see Unity creating the shadow map before rendering lit passes. You can even check out how the shadow map looks. The frame debugger also tells you which shader variant is currently active for any object. Navigate to the Draw Opaque Objects dropdown and then find your sphere. Check the shader name, it will be MyLit. You can see the current subshader and pass, and under that a list of defined keywords determining the shader variant. Try disabling soft shadows, cascades, and the main light game object to see how that influences things. The window doesn't really do a good job of keeping the same object selected, and you'll have to find your object again as you toggle things on and off. There will also be a slight difference depending on your Unity version, so keep all that in mind. You may have tried to apply the MyLit shader to your Shadowcaster sphere and notice that it no longer casts shadows. That's because casting and receiving shadows are completely different processes in 3D rendering, and we haven't dealt with casting yet. 
I mentioned URP creates a shadow map texture using another shader pass called the shadow caster pass. All we have to do to add shadow casting to my lit is write this pass. Remember, passes are shader subdivisions with their own vertex and fragment functions. Passes can also have their own multi-compile commands and shader variants. Each shader pass has a specific job given to it by URP. The forward lit pass calculates final pixel color, while the shadow caster pass calculates data for the shadow map. Honestly, this is all much simpler in practice than it sounds. URP takes care of calling the correct pass at the correct time and routing the output colors to the correct target. These abstract passes are kind of hard to visualize, so I find it's best to just start writing. Begin by adding another pass block to the mylit.shader file. Duplicate the forward lit pass, changing the name and light mode to shadow caster. There will be no lighting here. Delete the specular color define and the shader variant pragmas. For organization, I like to write each pass in its own HLSL file. Change the hash include line to refer to mylit shadowcaster pass.hlsl. Then create a new HLSL file called mylit shadowcaster pass.hlsl. Open that and start by defining the data structs. In attributes, we'll only need position, while interpolators only needs the clip space position. In the vertex function, call the URP function to convert position to clip space, and then set it in the output structure, and finally return it. In the fragment function, simply return zero. But wait, why did we just return zero? Isn't the shadow map supposed to encode distance from the light camera? It does, but the renderer handles this automatically. See, clip space positions encode something called depth, which is related to distance from the camera. When interpolating, the rasterizer stores the depth of each fragment in a data structure called the depth buffer. Unity utilizes the depth buffer to help reduce something called overdraw. Overdraw occurs when two or more fragments with the same pixel position are rendered during the same frame. When everything is opaque, only the closer fragment is ultimately displayed. Any other fragments are discarded, leading to wasted work. The rasterizer can avoid calling a fragment function if its depth is greater than the stored value in the depth buffer. URP reuses the depth buffer resulting from the shadow caster pass as the shadow map, but most other passes have a depth buffer of their own as well. Our mylit object should now cast shadows, but you'll see some really ugly artifacts. These are traditionally called shadow acne. These artifacts occur mostly on surfaces of a shadow casting object, it's another consequence of every programmer's bane, floating point errors. In this case, the shadow caster depth and the mesh depth are nearly equal, so the system sometimes draws the shadow on top of the casting surface. To fix this problem, we need to apply a bias or an offset to the shadow caster vertex positions. When calculating clip space positions, there's no rule that they must exactly match the mesh. We can offset the positions away from the light and also along the mesh's normals. Both of these biases help prevent shadow acne. The shadow caster now needs normals, so add a normal field to the attribute struct. Then add this function to calculate the offset clip space position. It requires world space position and normal. Apply shadow bias from URP's library will read and apply the shadow bias settings. It requires world space position and normal, as well as a rendering light's direction. URP also provides this in a global variable called light direction. First, we need to define it like a material property. Do that above the function and then pass it to apply shadow bias. Apply shadow bias returns a position in world space. Transform it to clip space using this other URP function, transform world to each clip. Clip space has depth boundaries, and if we accidentally overstep them when applying a bias, the shadow could disappear or flicker. The boundary to depth is defined by something called light near clip plane. Clamp the clip space z coordinate by the near plane value defined by this constant. To make things more complicated, certain graphics API reverse the clip space z axis. Thankfully, URP provides another Boolean constant to tell us if the boundary is a minimum or a maximum. Use a hash if statement to handle both cases and then return the final clip space position. 
calculate the world space position and normal using URP's conversion functions. Then call your custom Shadowcaster Clip Space function. Back in the scene editor, things might look immediately better. If not, edit the shadow bias settings and the near clip plane on the main light component. You can also set global bias settings on the URP settings asset. Before wrapping up, we can optimize the shadow caster a little bit by adding some metadata to the pass block. Since the shadow caster only uses the depth buffer, we can basically turn off color using the color mask command. This color mask zero command does just that, basically telling the renderer to write no color. By default, color mask is set to RGBA, which is what we want in the forward lit pass, for example. Lighting and shadows are some of the most fun aspects of shaders, and we'll be revisiting them much more throughout this series. After this tutorial, you'll have a good groundwork to continue with more complicated features. Later on, we've got point lights, spotlights, baked lights, emission, screen space shadows, and a whole lot more to get to. However, in the next tutorial, I'll pivot to transparency. We'll learn how to create transparent shaders, and how to handle their idiosyncrasies. I'll also introduce some of URP's powerful optimization tools. For your reference, here are the final versions of all the shader files in this tutorial. You can also view them on GitHub from a link in the video description. Please stay tuned, subscribe, and press the bell to be notified when my next video tutorial goes live. If you enjoyed this one, consider liking the video as well. It really helps out with the YouTube algorithm. Having any issues or questions? feel free to leave a comment or contact me on any of my social media. I read everything and I'll reply when I get a chance. I want to take another moment to thank all of my patrons for helping make this video possible and give a big shout out to my next gen patron, Kruby Dooby Doo. Thank you all so much. It really does mean a lot. And if you want to download example shaders from this tutorial and all of my other ones, consider joining my Patreon too. Thanks so much for watching and make games.